remembers um, Saturday Night Live 30, 40 years ago, you know, back when it was funny, right? You had Gilda Radner and Eddie Murphy, really funny folks. Uh, I, I don't even know if it's people still watch it today, but um, 30 years ago or so, there was this one episode or, or show where um, Tom Hanks, you know, class act, um, he was he was the guest um, guest presenter or whatever, and uh, it was his fifth his fifth time speaking on Saturday Night Live. So after he delivered his monologue, the first skit was he was ushered into this very sort of secretive room in the Saturday Night Live studios, the Five Timers Club, right? And you had to be so elite, you had to serve, you had to present at least five times. Um, and if you didn't, you know, even some of the good comedians uh, had to work in the Five Timers Club. So Conan O'Brien was the uh, the doorman, and John Lovitz had to be the waiter. Um, so so um, Tom Hanks gets ushered into the Five Timers Club, and there's these luminaries there like Paul Simon and um, Elliot Gould. And then over by the fireplace with a newspaper up uh, is the grand poobah of the Saturday Night Live Five Timers. And the paper comes down as Tom Hanks walks over. And of course, it's Steve Martin with a pipe and a smoking jacket, his slippered feet up on an ottoman. Um, this is my fifth time presenting. So uh, I feel like I'm joining an elite group. Um, and I assume after I'm done speaking today that um, I will be ushered into the uh, secret of Five Timers Club around the corner, uh, where I will be summoned into the presence of the ultimate uh, five timers or more. Um, the Steve Martin of the symposium, who of course would be Kathy Sturdivant there, I think. <laughs> so anyway, that said, um, today I'm also the first to go, which is quite an honor. Uh, so I'm going to make my presentation something like a prologue for the rest of the speakers today uh, and our theme of poets, professors, and provocateurs. And I'm going to talk about uh, Colorado Springs' original purveyor of poetry, scholarship, and provocative ideas, and that is Tribe and Jeffrey's bookstore. This is the interior of Tribe and Jeffreys. It was a short-lived bookstore, actually, uh, in the first decade of Colorado Springs. It started around 1875 and uh, only lasted a little bit less than six years. But here's what it looked like. This was at its location at 112 South Tejon. Uh, it considered itself a bookstore first and foremost, but obviously they sold other things. Um, you can see books up here, but they had stationery and, and various other things they sold. Um, and this, by the way, image is courtesy of the Ed and Nancy Bathke collection. And I believe Ed, at least, is in the audience today somewhere. Uh, I saw his name tag, but thanks, Ed. Um, so here's an advertisement for Tribe and Jeffrey from 1879. This was in the Colorado Springs City Directory, which they also happened to publish. They were also a publishing house. Um, they published stationery and contracts, blank forms, and, and books and things for Colorado College. Um, so they were a bookstore first and foremost, but they also sold things like... Um, uh, cutlery and fishing tackle and um, they sold they sold blank books for pressing flowers one of the presenters today will be talking about botany they also sold cookbooks lots of cookbooks and I believe we've hopefully got a presenter talking about cookbooks if uh, if that uh, gentleman made it um, so it was it was an interesting company but they they sold uh, books they considered themselves a bookstore first and foremost so in 1878 when I was doing research on the uh, the American Eclipse, which I've talked about before, some of you may have seen me, and incidentally, I have a book on sale with all the other great books back there. Um, I came across this ad because it was just a week before the eclipse occurred, and, and this was 10 years ago when I saw this, and I was like, well, that's really cool because what this is, Tribe and Jeffries listed all the books they have for sale at one point in time, and I always knew that this was something special to come across as, as a story, and I thought, this is cool. Um, it's sort of a, a literary, an insight into the, the past and kind of a literary barometer of what our, our first citizens might have been reading. Uh, doesn't mean they did read them. Doesn't mean all these books were sold, but um, it gives us a sense of what they could have read. And there were 150 books here, really more because there were, some of these were series, you know, of, of 10, 20, 30 books. Uh, and then at the bottom, they say here, all the above, this is the whole ad, this is a section of it, and this is the very bottom down here, all the above books and many others which we have in stock, many others. So there were, there were many more than this 150 they had listed. So um, in the spirit of, or the theme of today, I want to first talk about, I talk about the three categories, poetry, scholarship, or professors, I'm going to call science and scholarship, and then provocative ideas. So, and poetry, I'm going to include uh, fiction and, and literature. So they had for sale um, kind of the usual suspects of poetry. You had the Scottish poet Robert Burns and Ralph Waldo Emerson, the, uh, the Carey sisters, Alice and Phoebe, two American poets. Um, you see here a list of some of their special poetry works they had uh, for sale. Shelley's poetic works. I assume that's uh, Piercy Shelley when the C is a typo. Keats, um, Alice and Phoebe Carey, 
uh, something called the Household Book of Poetry, Moore's Complete Works, that's probably Thomas More, the Irish poet, Shakespeare, Lord Byron, and then Moore Shakespeare. These were actually very fancy. These are quite expensive for the time. These were leather-bound, gilt-type uh, poetry books. So, so quite a good selection of poetry. Um, and then they had quite a bit of fiction. This is the sort of stuff that I think if you walked into Barnes & Noble now, you would see on the bestseller shelves. Um, different things you wouldn't probably recognize now, but The Flag of Distress, this was sort of a South Seas adventure tale. Um, you know, lots of other things here, which I kind of, you can look up because they're all in the public domain now, but um, there were Jules, Jules Verne, Jules Verne, he, his books were there, some science fiction, um, what we would call science fiction. I don't think they used the term back then, but the automaton ear, right? I looked that up. I'm like, what's that? That's this great science fiction story about an inventor who uh, creates this mechanical ear and starts hearing voices from the past. You know, the Victorians love their time travel type stuff. So, but then I can't, so I started reading all, through some of these and there's this godson of a Marquis or Marquess, if you want to use the British pronunciation, I won't even try the French. I'm not good at French. Um, but I thought, I started reading this and I was like, wow, this particular book, uh, so I'm going to give some samples of some of the stuff that Tribe and Jeffrey had for sale. This particular book really seemed kind of to resonate to me with what, you know, the earliest Colorado Springs residents, um, with what the founders of Colorado Springs wanted in their earliest residence. So the, this godson of a marquis, the story was that basically there's this, 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 this is in France, it's a French author, uh, this, this illegitimate son of a, of a marquis. So, you know, assumes they sort of had a little, the marquis had a fling with a local peasant girl or something, had this illegitimate son. The son sort of by bootstrapping himself, by using his, his wiles and his intelligence, because he's still the son of a marquis, and, and getting the, the help of the locals, he sort of works his way back into legitimacy and eventually becomes the marquis of this provincial French town. So um, that's the story. In a way, that's very much like what the founders of Colorado Springs wanted in their earliest residence. Uh, they wanted to bring people here who were like that, because what they wanted were people who were sort of bourgeois, right, already educated and had maybe had some money, uh, yet provincial, um, refined and yet scrappy. You know, they, they may have had a good education, but they were willing to get their fingers dirty because that's what, what Palmer and Bell and all these other people needed. And if you need any proof of that, uh, William Bell, who was one of the founders uh, and an Englishman, in 1874, he went back to England and sort of just passed around this pamphlet, uh, which was called, and it, it became an article, uh, or I mean, a, you know, it would be published in papers, but it was Colonies of Colorado in their relations to English enterprise and settlement. And what he was, it was basically an advertisement saying, hey, you, 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 you who aren't the first sons in line for your family's inheritance, but have a little money, come to Colorado, because what we're looking for are the sons of men of more or less wealth, you know, you've got a little money, uh, <laughs> who, you know, being obliged to make a living for themselves, you aren't going to get the, uh, the full inheritance, have the opportunity in Colorado of acquiring business habits and knowledge capable of, be, of being turned to practical account. Come to Colorado with your education, the money you have, and make something of yourselves in this really cool, very English, little London sort of place, right? So the godson of a marquee, I think, on sale at Tribe and Jaffer was kind of uh, uh, resonated with what they were looking for uh, for the earliest residents. So I thought that was pretty cool. Whether or not it was read or sold, I don't know. So moving on to the professor's uh, category, I'm going to sort of look at, you know, works of science and scholarship that were for sale at Tribe and Jeffrey. Uh, under what I'm going to call hard science, not just because it's sort of the physics and chemistry, not the social sciences and all that soft namby-pamby stuff, but hard science, it's a double entendre because I also think this is really hard stuff um, for sale in sort of a popular bookstore, right? I mean, this is, this is, um, some pretty intense stuff. International Scientific Series, this was a series that began in the 1870s and published volumes every year or so, up until the early 1900s, um, covering everything from like volcanoes to starfish. So some of the earliest volumes were for sale. You had, of course, Darwin's works, no surprise there. Uh, you also had um, books by Thomas Huxley, who was the self-described bulldog, Darwin's bulldog. Darwin was sort of a shy fellow, didn't um, you know want to, to go duke it out uh, in this in the in the public forum but Thomas Huxley was more than happy to to fight for the for Darwin's theory of, of uh, evolution by natural selection on his behalf so D Huxley called himself Darwin's bulldog but anyway uh, he also uh, Huxley had the anatomy of vertebrated animals which is sort of a dry you know for uh, text on vertebrated animals and man's place in nature which I'll talk about in a second so he had Huxley's works Another series called Deschanel's Natural Philosophy um, with multiple volumes. Uh, Darwiniana, there's an A missing here. Again, there were a lot of typos, I think, in this ad by uh, Darwin's close friend, Professor Aza Gray, who is a botanist at Harvard. Uh, and, and Gray actually was, was, qu was quite a religious man. And so his book, Darwiniana, was an attempt to bridge sort of the irreligiosity of, of, of natural selection with, um, 
with uh, theism, with, with, with the Christian religion. So an interesting book there. Uh, and Gray and Darwin's other friend, Joseph Dalton Hooker, actually came to Colorado on a botanizing trip about this time and had lunch. Uh, General Palmer had them over, I think, to um, Glen Erie for lunch, which is pretty cool. So, uh, and then very technical manuals like or books like Blowpipe Analysis and Elements of Geology, which you know seem kind of esoteric. But remember, back then these were probably bestsellers in Colorado Springs because so many people coming here were um, in the mining industry, were doing assaying and that sort of thing. And Blowpipe Analysis is is key to assaying metals, um, so it's a technical manual. But these are the sorts of things that were for sale right next to Shakespeare and stuff in Tribe and Jeffrey. So pretty cool. So for example, here's a couple volumes of Deschanel's Natural Philosophy, which a friend of mine sent from his library. Um, oh, the words got a little big here, but um, anyway, so these were volumes on heat and electricity and magnetism, you know, not, not the sort of thing you might pick up in Barnes and Noble uh, these days, but these were for sale. Also, The Elements of Geology, uh, that book that was for sale, uh, this is the, by Joseph LeConte, a French um, author, but this is the 1878 version. This is the same edition that would have been for sale in Tribe and Jeffrey. Um, interestingly, I was looking through other editions just for fun, and I saw the 1905 edition, um, so about 30 years later, well after Tribe and Jeffrey had closed down, but um, the 1906 or 1905 edition on page six, I saw this. Anything seem familiar? Pretty cool, huh? So right here, Balanced Rock from Art Garden of the Gods, right in the, in the first chapter, they used a, something from our local community as, as one of their examples. So I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, there was also, uh, History was a perennial bestseller. <laughs> no surprise, right, people? Um, so Tribe and Jaffray sold all the usual suspects, lots of military history, which is extremely popular. But uh, Edward Gibbon's History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, um, Thomas Macaulay's uh, multi-volume History of England, starting with James II, um, so things like that. Uh, and then, of course, we get to provocative publications. Um, now, I put provocateurs here with a question mark because, you know, to us these days, this might not quite seem so provocative, but if you cast your mind back 150 years or so, like we're talking about, um, some of these things were quite provocative. First of all, Thomas Paine. Now, granted, these, his books were already a century old at this point, and Thomas Paine um, wrote Rights of Man, which is one of the key texts that sort of lit a fire for the American Revolution. Uh, but Thomas Paine was also um, a quite ardent anti theist, meaning um, he was against sort of the, he, he had some real problems with Christianity. Uh, he didn't consider himself an atheist. He considered himself a deist, like many of our founding fathers, where they believed in a God that sort of created and controlled the universe, but not one that would come down in personal form and sort of save you and, and, and you know, get involved. In other words, God sort of was a clockmaker, set the things in motion and went on. And so he considered himself a deist. Teddy Roosevelt, our president, called Pain, that filthy atheist. Um, but, but so anyway, but in his age of reason, which was different than the rights of man, it was sort of a prolonged and multifaceted attack on, on theology, on Christianity. And, and so it was quite provocative. And one of his, he uses all kinds of different arguments, but since I do history of astronomy, and one of his arguments in this age of reason was, um, you know, we think that the idea of planets around other suns inhabited life, extraterrestrial life, might be a fairly new concept. It really wasn't. I mean, the idea that stars could be other suns with planets and worlds, inhabited worlds around them, goes back quite a few centuries. And one of the arguments Tom Paine makes in the Age of Reason was that, well, you know, if God created this big, great universe with all these other planets all inhabited, which was a fairly common belief back then that, they, that a benevolent God would sort of create these sorts of things. Well, what's he going to do? You know, send, send himself, you know, in a, in a form back down to Earth, every, I mean, back down to all these planets, you know, this infinite number of worlds. He's gonna, never going to have time to work on the universe. He's going to be saving all these different planets and stuff. So those are the sorts, I mean, I'm paraphrasing. He does it much more eloquently, but that's the sort of argument that Thomas Paine made. And so his, his you know, this would have been, I think, a very, very um, provocative sort of work, even though it was a century old at that point, because um, Victorians loved to argue their um, science versus religion and let themselves be titillated by it, like they did with Darwin's Origin of Species, which I think I don't even need to describe. I mean, it's, it's not even 20 years old at this point. In 1878, The Origin of Species was first published in uh, 1859, and of course, um, it, was, it was certainly a controversial work. Um, even more controversial, as I mentioned before, was um, the work of Thomas Huxley, who was not afraid to uh, come out and um, fight for uh, Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection in the face of those um, in the religious community who would, who would um, want to denounce it. And so 
uh, Huxley in Man's Place in Nature makes explicit the argument for uh, you know humans and, and apes being descended from a common ancestor. So. Um, so that, those are kind of the three themes. And since there were so many other cool things in the Tribe and Jaffre ad, I just thought I'd mention um, the children's books, which I saw. There were many more books for boys, which probably isn't a surprise. But um, um, one of them <laughs> was the Campfires of Napoleon comprising the most brilliant achievements of the emperor and his marshals. So 1878, we're 60 years on from Waterloo. And there's this book, and it's, it's, in, it's English, you know. And it's it's this pra- it's this hagiography of of Napoleon for little boys and well Napoleon was one of the world's great military strategists and he was a brilliant man he was a s- sociopath I mean he had no res- concern for the lives of his men he just wanted to to win and he did most of the time um, but it's just so interesting that this would be one of those edifying books for young men I just I mean and and it's interesting because it goes through each of the campaigns in a way that young boys could could understand and, um, I don't know I just found it fascinating that this is the sort of thing that that you'd give to your son and say, you know, Napoleon. Because you know, obviously, I mean, he had many support, you know, many people like Napoleon in the Anglo-American world, but um, he was obviously still, you know, the one that the Duke of Wellington defeated at Waterloo. And then for girls, there were these cool, I mean, I thought they were kind of cool, the Dottie Dimple stories, right? Which seems sort of belittling, but I mean, the, Dottie is actually pretty spunky. She will kind of, you know, not always listen to her parents or nanny. She'll get in a little trouble. She'll come back. Um, and you know things will work out, but there's a lot of, they didn't say which Dottie Dimple stories were for sale, um, but I couldn't help but think that they would have had Dottie Dimple out west because it was published you know in time for it, and and so here's the frontispiece, and here's a picture from inside where she goes on a train ride out west with her family and nanny and brother and stuff, and at this point they're stopping and collecting nuts, um, and so I just I, don't know, I thought it was cool, so um, so. Um, those were the three themes, poets, professors, and provocateurs, uh, poetry, literature, scholarship, science, and provocative publications. Tribe and Jaffray's final chapter, um, the, this great bookstore, which was not the first, but the biggest, at least in those, that first decade, um, went out in, a big, in big flames. So what happened was George Jaffray, Tribes, Thomas Tribe's partner, um, basically um, signed a chattel mortgage, which is mortgage for the property owned without tribe's permission, without Thomas tribe's permission. In other words, he, he, he sold everything for $12,500 to someone. Uh, who that was was interesting, but it's not part of the story here. Um, without tribe's permission. So bottom line is there were lawsuits and other creditors were like, hey, you can't do that. And so there were lawsuits and, and the U.S. Marshals came in and took over the stock, not only in Colorado Springs, but they had opened a branch store up in Leadville. Um, and, um, and the thing fell apart because one partner basically kind of screwed over the other. Um, you can see that George Jaffray signed here. This is the shadow mortgage. Um, he signed Tribe and Jaffray. There's his, there's his handwriting. George Jaffray, but no Thomas Tribe. And to add insult to injury for poor Thomas Tribe, this form, this shadow mortgage, which was blank and filled out and, and transferred all the stuff over to um, what well, made the, the, the firm fall apart, was actually printed on Tribe and Jaffray stationery. It says, form is for sale, printed by Tribe and Jaffray. So anyway, and then here are a few examples of, uh, from the Leadville Daily Herald where um, the, they're talking about you know, how they basically have to liquidate the stock in order to cover all these lawsuits and stuff like that. So that was the end of Tribe and Jaffray, but just the beginning of Colorado Springs as a place for poets, professors, and provocateurs. So, all right. Thank you for having me here. Okay, so in postcards that Ellen Jack sold to tourists, this is her self-described title, Mining Queen of the Rockies. Now, postcards were very popular in the early 1900s, but it was very unusual for a woman to publish a set of postcards about herself. She published her autobiography in 1910, and that was recently republished. Now, how many people here have heard of Captain Jack or read her book or, okay, so you, good, okay. Um, So she sold her books at her roadhouse that was located on the high drive outside of Colorado Springs. She called herself the fairy. Now, a definition of the fairy is A woman thought to possess extraordinary or magical powers, first used by Shakespeare in describing Cleopatra, an attractive or seductive woman. 
The word is also applied to a small or delicate person. You can see in the photograph that she is quite small in stature, but she certainly was not at all delicate in terms of her personality. So I'm gonna very briefly go through what did she do before she got to Colorado Springs. She was born in England in 1842. She married Charles Jack, an officer on a ship. After he died of injuries related to his Civil War service, she came out to Colorado to seek her fortune. She did own a half interest in the Black Queen mine. On this map, you can see Gunnison at the bottom and then all the way up there at the top, located near Crystal, Colorado, was the Black Queen Mine. So what I'm gonna focus on in today's talk is what kind of roadhouse did she operate on the high drive and one of her false stories. Now actually, most of the stories in her book are true and a few of them are exaggerations. So hopefully you're familiar with this part of the North Cheyenne Canyon, so here's the canyon going past the Bruin Inn on the high drive and her place was located there on the saddle between the two drainages. Postcards were quite popular among tourists in the early 1900s, so here's just a few of the views. So here's uh, along North Cheyenne Canyon, the Bruin Inn, and then along the high drive. Tourist operators would bring tourists. Here's uh, Wilbur O'Brien had his uh, Burrow's, Burrow Line, he brought tourists up to view Captain Jack's supposed mine. She did have mining claims up here, but her claims here never really amounted to anything, but she pretended that they did. And uh, actually in assay reports, there were only very trace amounts of gold uh, that were reported. Now one of Ellen's newspaper ads read, fine chicken dinner served in home style at the summit of the high drive for 50 cents each. Another directory read, the high drive, one of the most picturesque mountain highways in the world, an exclusive carriage ride through beautiful North Cheyenne Canyon, stopping at the Bruin Inn and Captain Jack's unique refreshment pavilions. From 1907 to 1909, she would be charged with selling liquor without a license. <laughs> and so maybe that's what the ad meant by unique refreshment. Now times are changing around the country as numerous groups pressed for changes in liquor laws and the country headed towards prohibition. And Captain Jack had run saloons in Colorado's pioneer days, but now she would face pressure to close down her place on the high drive. Uh, General William Palmer had banned saloons in Colorado Springs, and he didn't have any objection to people of his social class uh, consuming alcohol, they could obtain a prescription and get alcohol at local drugstores for medicinal purposes. <laughs> the WCTU was active in Colorado Springs. The union here was founded in 1880. In 1906, Carrie Nation toured through several Colorado cities, including Colorado Springs. In Colorado Springs, she promised to smash a storefront and a crowd gathered at the Owl Drug Store to witness her potential hatchet-wielding stunt. Instead, she merely broke a bottle of beer. She called out the hypocrisy of Colorado Springs residents who had banned saloons but had allowed alcohol to be sold as medicine. She told the crowd, you don't know the meaning of prohibition. You are all a lot of drunkards and cigarette fiends. So the headline, Carrie did no smashing, was the mo most noteworthy aspect of her trip to neighboring Colorado City. In 1907, uh, Ellen Jack faced the charges of selling liquor without a license and the jury could not reach a verdict. Now, over the next several months, the court summoned her to appear and each time there would be a delay. And meanwhile, over the summer, wild times prevailed at Captain Jack's Roadhouse. Two lovers, uh, Laura Matthews and Amos Rumbau, used her roadhouse for their trysts. The 19-year-old Laura Matthews had come to Colorado Springs from Chicago to seek relief from her nervous troubles, accompanied by her nurse, Tilly Green. Amos Rumbau bragged that while uh, many men pursued the beautiful Laura Matthews, she went on carriage rides only with him. One night in July at Captain Jack's, Amos asked Laura 
to marry him, and he flashed $1,000 worth of bills in front of her face. She spurned his advances. In fact, Laura seemed very upset that he was lavishing all this money on her. Ellen advised her to take the money, if for no other reason, that it would keep him from spending it foolishly himself. <laughs> Ellen thought Laura was afraid of him. Ellen also suspected that the nurse, Tilly Green, had hypnotized Laura. Ellen said, the strange look on the girl's face when the party was at my place told me she was in trouble. Ellen felt that something dark was about to happen, that perhaps somebody would try to rob Rumbau, or worse. As Laura and Amos left her roadhouse that night, Ellen rode with them to the mouth of the canyon, taking along her pistol for protection. Laura's parting words to Captain Jack were, I'm going on a long jury, journey and you'll not see me again. Laura met her death two days later. The news did not surprise Captain Jack. She was found along the road on Broadmoor Hill. Her outstretched arm pointed to the gun that lay two feet away. It was ruled as a suicide, but many people suspected that she had been murdered. Amos Rumbaugh shot himself just two days later. The coroner's jury ruled both deaths as suicides, but people continue to wonder about whether Laura had been murdered. Perhaps these wild times and tragic deaths contributed to the attempts to close down Captain Jack's roadhouse. One temperance lecturer described the saloon as a murderer. It not only slays the better self of the drinker, but the traffic incites deeds of violence. Now Ellen would face liquor charges again the following summer in 1908. She pled not guilty to all the charges, and she believed that the law interfered with her rights, and she vowed to fight the charges once again. General Palmer backed the liquor charges against Ellen. So about this time, Ellen wrote a flattering poem to William Palmer. I don't know if she did this to butter him up or get him on her side or leave her alone, but I'm not gonna read the poem, but basically it talks about Palmer's Civil War service. He came to Colorado Springs, founded the city, built the high drive, and here Captain Jack stands watch, uh, has old glory flying up on the hill. So the end of the liquor cases finally arrived uh, when Sheriff Grimes seized her beer uh, due to a, another court judgment against her uh, so Sheriff Grimes took possession of three barrels and numerous quarts of Budweiser, Blue Ribbon, and Getz beer. And in 1909, at a public auction at the county courthouse, Sheriff Grimes sold the beer to the Philip Smith Drug Company. <laughs> so perhaps now it could be sold for medicinal purposes. Now, Ellen Jack does not write about these cases because her autobiography ends about the mid-1890s, but in her autobiography, she does give her opinion of temperance reformers, and you might imagine what it would be. She said, I find a lot of people banded together as temperance unions who have been reformed drunkards and had to take a big oath and have a mob at their backs to keep them from getting drunk. These are all degenerates. For if man or woman cannot drink beer, wine, or liquor without getting beastly intoxicated, he has no willpower and is a degenerate. These people are a curse to the country. They want to take the rights of the level-headed people away. Now, in her interviews about the Laura Matthews case, uh, Captain Jack made sure to point out that she is, in fact, was a hero of frontier days. This was one of the postcards that she put out at her roadhouse claiming that she uh, killed Indians. And she told this story many times. So she told a story about fighting Indians when they came into the town of Gunnison. And she explained the scar on her forehead as stemming from a tomahawk blow. She told this tale to many tourists. So what she said in her autobiography is during the attack, an Indian struck her on the head with a blow from a poisoned tomahawk. And then she goes on to say that the Ute Indian chief Coloro uh, heard of her plight and he came in to Gunnison to save uh, Ellen Jack. He administered a medicine to counteract the poison of the tomahawk blow. Okay. 
Now this story is really unlikely to be true. <laughs> I know, a surprise. Uh, she really arrived in Gunnison after uh, the Indian attacks and fights were over, um, although people were fearful of an attack, uh, and so there's really nothing to corroborate uh, this story. In fact, there's no evidence that Ellen Jack killed anyone, uh, although she did use her gun several times to uh, fend off uh, other prospectors who were trying to encroach on her claims. Now, why would she make up this story? Uh, while this tale of fighting and killing Indians might offend uh, our modern sensibilities, uh, it actually was a quite common story at the time. In fact, uh, people were already starting to romanticize the early pioneer days. Uh, Buffalo Bill certainly did this in his Wild West show as well. So how did she get that scar on her forehead? Well, for that story, we have to go back to the early days at Jack's Cabin, which was her boarding house and saloon that was in Gunnison. So here, this is Main Street, this is Tamichi, and then the inside, these low buildings would be uh, Jack's Cabin. Uh, she was assisted by the saloon keeper, Jeff Mickey, who became her husband. And there's another picture, uh, those buildings over here, uh, one of the only pictures I've ever found partially showing that. So what happened was, on Christmas Day, 1880, the Methodists rang their first church bell. The newspaper men hoped that the bell's tolling would serve as a warning, conveying to many thoughtless ones that it is the Lord's Day. But at Jack's cabin, an affray broke out that evening. Four Frenchmen had arrived in town to celebrate, and an argument ensued about the bar bill. Harsh words escalated into a fight that spilled out onto the street, breaking the stillness of the silent night. Captain Jack joined the row and attempted to assault one man with a bottle, but she was no match for the men who beat her with <laughs> sticks, clubs, and their fists. Three shots rang out from saloon keeper Jeff Mickey's gun, and one bullet burrowed into the arm of one of the assailants. Jeff Mickey suffered a severe beating, and the assailants landed in jail. It is from this fight that Ellen sustained the injury that left a permanent scar on her forehead. Ellen Jack's assailant faced a judge and he received a $50 fine for the assault. The beating left Ellen bruised and sore and she was unable to carry out her business for weeks. She filed a civil suit against her assailants. Ellen's lawyer said, well, the guy admitted he beat her up so she should win her case. But the judge said, not so fast. His instructions to the jury amounted to basically telling them how they should rule. The judge argued that even though the assailant had struck Ellen Jack, they should find in favor of the defendants because Ellen had come out of her house to the scene of the affray and had taken a part in it. She had assaulted the defendants with a bottle and had sustained her injuries while taking an active part in the fighting. The jury had to decide if she was entirely blameless in the matter. And if the jury was without, and if the injury was bought without any fault on her part. Judge Smith also stated that the fact that Ellen was a woman should not carry any weight in their deliberations. <laughs> Ellen Jack lost the case. Jeff Mickey was found guilty of assault with intent to commit murder, and he received a $80 fine. Now, also in mid-May, the sheriff arrested both Jeff Mickey and Ellen Jack on charges of keeping a disorderly house. The complaint alleged that on December 25th and on many other days in the ensuing months, the couple permitted and encouraged gaming, drinking, cursing, swearing, quarreling, challenging to fight, fighting, and otherwise misbehaving during both day and nighttime hours. Their conviction resulted in a $30 fine. Now, Ellen Jack died in 1921, and in many of the obituaries that ran in various newspapers, this story about her being an Indian fighter is once again appears. Um, the only one that perhaps came closest to getting the truth is the Gunnison News Champion, 
there is a seamy side to the life of this Wild West character. It is doubtful, for instance, whether her stories of Indian Wars had any foundation in fact. So I think through these stories you can definitely see that Ellen Jack was both a poet and a provocateur. Thank you. How many of you here are familiar with Ellen T. Brindley that don't work in special collections? <laughs> okay, that's good. You're probably a longtime residents of Colorado Springs. Uh, uh, Ellen uh, has kind of faded from the history of Colorado Springs uh, over time, and uh, I think it's important we take a look at her contributions to the Pikes Peak region, and today I'll be uh, talking about her using some of the wonderful archival materials in special collections. So a lot of this research depends upon that. Now, let's take a look at the 1931 uh, Gazette obituary for Ellen using the uh, terms that you see up here on the screen. Uh, her importance and wealth is kind of belied by the fact that uh, she has a very Spartan headstone in uh, Evergreen Cemetery. But uh, after her death, her legacy was continued for about 50 years with the L&T Brinley Guild. And we'll take a look at all of these background items uh, in her history. She was uh, born in 1856 in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, the daughter of George Brindley and uh, Frances Ellen Terry, who she's named after. Her, uh, her father's family was a member of the Boston Brahmins, the Boston elite, and uh, her father got all of his wealth passed down from uh, his father, who was a wealthy Boston merchant. I want you to take a look at the 1860 census here. Here we see Ellen, uh, five years old. I want to bring your attention to her older sister, Catherine, who would be very important in uh, her entire life after this point. Her parents here, her father is listed as a capitalist, okay? <laughs> All my ancestors were farmers who in this column for real estate value and personal value of uh, personal estate, my ancestors had hundreds of thousands, uh, hundreds of dollars. This man had 400, over $400,000 in assets. This is a significant amount of money. Now, for the rest of the presentation, I have uh, computed the value in today's dollars for those values back then, just to give you an idea of the money. But this is at the low end uh, of computations using the uh, CPI here. Uh, you can multiply by 10 in some of these computations for the true value of the estate. Um, so, a very wealthy family. Uh, Ellen lived with her parents till their deaths in the mid-1870s, uh, and then uh, moved to Waltham, Mass, to live with her sister and her family. Uh, Catherine uh, was uh, her sister, and uh, she was married to a very prominent doctor, Dr. Benjamin Faneuil Duncan Adams, uh, a very beloved doctor uh, who had old money also. There's a lot of old money floating around here and famous names with his uh, given names there. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Adams contracted TB, had to give up his medical practice and moved to Colorado Springs about 1884 and Ellen tagged along with the family. She lived with her sister until 1905 and her sister's death. So she was with that family for quite a while. Um, when they moved here, uh, Ellen and Catherine had a uncle that was a retired doctor that was here. And uh, we see the first reports of Dr. Adams in the uh, January 1885 Gazette, where he has presented his medical license to the county clerk, although he never used it. Uh, uh, he never uh, you know, acted as a doctor in this area. And he was drafting up plans for a new house on Cascade Avenue. Now, in the year between the uh, filing of the, uh, the plans for the house and its final construction, uh, Ellen lived with uh, Dr. Adams and his family at a boarding house on North Weber here in town uh, until that house was completed. And during that first year in town, the BFD Adams photo collection provides a treasure trove of images of daily life in what was known as Little London at this time. 
Here are the three uh, photo albums in special collections. I have to tell you right away, I, I grew up, I was a teenager, I had my own dark room in my house, uh, processed film and so forth. I can tell you that the photos in this album uh, are not commercially printed uh, pictures. They are contact prints from four by six glass and eggs, probably uh, processed at home. Uh, their, their quality varies greatly, which tells me that they were homemade prints, which is, which is fine. Wonderful collection. Let's take a look at what's in there. The standard landscapes. Now you would see these with a, a standard commercial photographer, but they were taken by uh, someone in the house. We have Grace Chapel up there. We have Garden of the Gods. But the true value of these prints is of the people. These are wonderful, wonderful shots. First of all, of children. If you look over on the far side over here, there are three little girls standing there holding up their dolls. Now, I have a trivia question for you. See that big box on the street next to them? Lots of houses uh, in Colorado Springs at that time had a box in front of their house. Does anybody know what those are? Those are horse mounting blocks. Especially for women on side saddles, they needed something like this. Now, we also have wonderful shots of upper class children with the garb. You can tell that they are uh, uh, wealthy on burrows. I can imagine the photographer saw these children out on the street, said, come on over, let me take your picture, or up on the uh, front deck of this house. They just really capture a lot of the, the character of uh, children as well as adults. Here, one of my favorite pictures is up here. These women in 1885, 1886, uh, in the foothills, people getting together on steps. Here's some sort of luncheon going on here. And a probable nanny here uh, with a baby in a perambulator in front of a newly constructed house here with some people standing outside of it. Also, uh, these three albums uh, have picnics and outings in it. Again, these are all well-to-do people. They have free time, they're out here enjoying life. We can see here there's a man with a banjo here. Uh, draw your attention to this lady, we'll see her a little bit uh, later. But just uh, uh, well-to-do people enjoying life, as I said. Also people on horseback. This is a, a kind of a rare photo of cowboys rounding up horses. You don't get the opportunity to see action shots like this very often. And then a, a woman riding side saddle here and some of her compatriots out on an outing. Also some nice available light portraits here. This showed that uh, somebody knew what they were doing when they took these photos in the album. Which leads me to uh, think, uh, who was the photographer? Well, that question was answered in the 1885 uh, Colorado State Census. Here we have uh, Dr. Adams, retired physician, his family. Down here, there's Ellen Brindley. What is she listed as? A photographer. Now, let me tell you, at this time, we didn't have roll film cameras in the Kodak Brownies yet. This woman was trained to use field view cameras with glass plate negatives to process this stuff at home in a very rudimentary environment. And I can guarantee you after doing this at home, it was a challenge and she had to be trained for this. But she was wealthy. She could afford the very expensive equipment and this was her hobby. And this was the legacy that she left behind to us. Well, let's put a face on that name. We're lucky enough to have this 1905 uh, Philadelphia portrait, which is in special collections, that kind of lays the, the, the baseline for what she looked like in uh, uh, 1905. Let's go back 20 years and correlate that to this woman in the photo albums. I am convinced that she took these photos. In the photos that she's in, she set up the camera and had somebody go push the plunger and so forth. Uh, there she is on uh, <coughs> horseback. Uh, but she looks kind of spunky, I'd say. I think she had a, a really great character, and we'll find out that to be true later on here. Also, with little scribblings of initials, I was able to correlate her family members to the photos in these albums. We can see on the far side uh, Dr. Brindley, or Dr. Adams, who died in 1895. 
uh, sister Catherine, her uh, nephew uh, Edward Brindley Adams, who was the head librarian of the Harvard Law School, prominent position. I've been able to correlate this later photo. That is him. I am positive of it. And she had two nieces, Kay or Catherine. Uh, Kay lived with Ellen as a caretaker and a companion her entire life. Uh, until Ellen died in 1931. And unfortunately, her sister, Nanny or Ann, died of diphtheria in uh, 1888. But uh, so we have the family here. Let's take a look at the house. She took wonderful photos of this new mansion that was being built uh, on uh, Cascade at Boulder Avenue. We can see the well appointed parlor here. This was. Uh, Nellie's room. This was Ellen's room. What is the key feature that you see pictured in this room? <laughs> Books. These, the, you will see why this is important to her a little bit later. And also in the mist here, we see the Antlers Hotel. Nothing between this house and the Antlers Hotel, which tells you uh, what things were like at that time. Again, a wonderful collection of photos. Uh, continues on with the dining room over here. Uh, front room and uh, uh, the doc good doctor's office. What was life like in the home of Dr. Adams? Well, they came out here as a prominent family and immediately took up a position of leadership. Uh, comments that, uh, that I've seen in, uh, in the obituary for uh, the nephew of Ellen who died in 1922. Basically, no one of interest came to Colorado Springs who did not visit their house a very prominent family here in town. And of course, the mixture of these people here was very cosmopolitan. You had people from Europe, from around the United States, coming to this, this health resort, uh, many of them coming for the cure for tuberculosis. And uh, uh, Ellen's niece, in 1958, stated uh, this bottom statement here, she was one, young enough to enjoy the young life of the young city riding trips and picnics of, at the bluffs. She saw those pictures in the photo album and that, that really was kept in her memory her entire life. Well, where did Ellen the philanthropist come from? Well, we already have a good idea that when uh, George died, he passed uh, assets down to his kids. He had a lot of property, uh, it, basically in the millions of dollars, dividends and so forth. Uh, but the, the true value of his estate was in one of the finest rare book collections in America. You can Google this man's name and find uh, catalogs that are still available that you could order to take a look at those 12,000 volumes that were sold over three decades uh, in time that provided Ellen and uh, her sister Catherine uh, with a lot of the wealth that uh, was uh, was brought uh, to the family. Uh, first dibs was given on, on, on books to uh, colleges, uh, both uh, Yale and other colleges uh, got a, a good chunk of books. And then the uh, sales that you see here brought uh, the total to uh, almost $6 million in books that were distributed to Ellen as well as her sister Catherine in the form of at least $3 million. I got to believe it's probably more like 7 or $8 million at least that was passed down between the years that you see here. Well, where did Ellen invest her inheritance? Uh, I found her investing a lot in land along the front range, buying and selling land. But also, <clears throat> she invested in mining companies up the I-70 corridor. You'll notice these are actually certificates made out to her as well as New Mexico Development Corporation. I found these in the state archives in her probate records. These were stocks and bonds that were worthless upon her death. Therefore, they just ret were retained in her probate records uh, and not cashed in because there was no value in them. She's first mentioned uh, in Colorado Springs as a distinguished visitor in a Leadville newspaper going up uh, to Leadville with her sister accompanying the uh, editor of the Gazette and a state senator. So we know that she's in a pretty high class company here. Uh, and then she started getting involved with uh, different organizations in town, of course, with that, the great books that her father had her around all this time in which 
she she became uh, accustomed to. Uh, she was in, interested in, in philosophy and theology. Uh, she served uh, in uh, either presidential or executive roles in these particular organizations. That last organization, she was going around twisting arms to get funds to build a women's dormitory for Colorado College. That building still exists today, constructed in 1891. It's Montgomery Hall, and it's on the National Register of Historic Places. Very close to the library here in the educational arena, she was on the board of directors of the Carnegie Library and a book committee member. When she went back, and I think she got that nice 1905 Philadelphia portrait done of her, she also visited librarians in Boston and Philadelphia to come up with the uh, 2,000 books that the Carnegie Library should get when they open the next year. She also was involved with the Pikes Peak uh, Red Cross, so Pikes Peak chapter of the Red Cross, uh, United Way sort of organization, Associated Charities, Humane Society, but her real passion was uh, uh, with the Young Women's uh, Christian Association. She felt, not sorry, but compassionate for the young women that were coming out here away from home and dove into the why heart and soul uh, following the guidelines here to provide a whole atmosphere of hominess uh, with building a new building. So um, she got involved with the YWCA in 1899. Her sister lent about a half a million dollars because they probably couldn't get a bank loan for operational funds in 1901 and Ellen was listed as the liable agent should the loan fall through. She was elected the president of the YWCA in uh, 1909, served for 12 years, and from the get-go, her goal was to build a large building downtown uh, with a $100,000 uh, fund drive, uh, about $2.6 million today, to build a building at Kiowa and Nevada. Substantial donations came in initially, uh, 5000 $1,000 donations. We're talking $100,000, $25,000 donations. Before she came in, we can see the 1909 listings of contributions. Uh, General Palmer gave $50 here, a couple hundred dollar donations. And uh, in the archives uh, that are available at Special Collections, we see these massive $5,000, $1,000 donations. Catherine Adams here is Ellen's niece. She has now taken on a, a role in helping out the Y with Miss Brindley here giving $500. What that led to in 1912 was the laying of the cornerstone of the new building. 2,000 people came to this. Uh, Ellen uh, was the featured speaker here. And in 1913, October, uh, it uh, opened to rave reviews. It's a large multi-story building. We can see the, the actual Costs here, $54,000 for the construction of the building, 3,400 to Otis Elevator, Van Briggle got 1,000 for that total. Needless to say, I think the computation of this would probably more be more like $15 million to build a building like that today. Uh, very graciously, Ellen and the board turned over the uh, building to the Red Cross during the great flu epidemic of 1918, and for three months, the Red Cross used it as a hospital. Before that, a nice addition was uh, added right behind the main building, a huge gymnasium, one of the state-of-the-art facilities in the West that uh, really added to the physical development of the, uh, of the women uh, involved here. She uh, had to resign due to health, ill health, after uh, 12 years, but the Gazette really lauded her for her keen vision uh, in the development of a wonderful facility. Uh, when she uh, resigned, they were uh, operating uh, an over a million dollar budget per year. Her legacy still remains, this beautiful building downtown. Uh, although it was slated for destruction in the 1970s, a banker uh, bought it up and uh, it is on the National Register of Historic uh, Places at this present time. And uh, finally, in the religious view, uh, aspect of her life, 
Uh, she was very prominent in the Episcopal Church here in town first with uh, Grace Chapel. She took this photograph, I am convinced, in 1885. And after the split in the congregation in 1893, she uh, helped to form St. Stephen's and then reunited these two churches later on. She was very proud of the church. When her niece came out from Philadelphia, that was the first place they would stop in 1926 to view the new uh, towers here. <clears throat> uh, beloved by the church, they thought that after her death and with the Great Depression really impacting parts of El Paso County, there was a need for a charitable organization to be established. And the guild was established with the hope we can render the same sort of useful service to the community which Miss, uh, filled Miss Brindley's lifestyle. So uh, we, uh, we see that and then the pastor said, thought it was more appropriate to name it after her than a saint. So over the years, uh, initially it was uh, clothes that were distributed to the needy around town. Then they started uh, distributing food, school equipment, books, and medical help throughout the whole, uh, whole county. Again, the eastern part of the county was the most hard hit. Uh, fortunately, the federal government came in and relieved them of some of those uh, uh, needs to, to do, and, and they kind of focused on individuals and families. And then uh, they broadened their uh, scope to other counties and to Indian reservations in the uh, Four Corners area. 1946, they started supporting the juvenile detention home here in town. And after World War II, they saw the destruction that was left behind after the war, and they started shipping tons of food and supplies to first European countries, then to Asia, and for years they received letters of gratitude from around the world for this. Uh, finally, in the 1980s, the Guild volunteers kind of dwindled. They decided to close up the Guild after 50 years, and almost 2,000 women participated in this over the half century of support to uh, the area. And there's a nice book down in Special Collections if you want to read it about the Guild. And then fin finally, in wrapping it up here, I have some uh, comments that I found in notes from her uh, Philadelphia niece who would come out here to visit. Uh, Ellen really liked people. You can tell that from those uh, early pictures. Uh, you know, her, her niece would say, but Aunt Nellie, these people don't go together that you're, that you're inviting. Uh, and they all went together at her table. Uh, the queerest people enjoyed themselves with her help. Now, the following picture, thank, thanks to Pioneers Museum, does not apply to this statement. Here is Ellen over here on the far left, commiserating with some very famous movers and shakers here in Colorado Springs. But you'll notice that she has a little smile on her face because she's going to start going into the mode we see here that her niece was talking about she always liked to take the opposite conservative view of things here in Colorado Springs and, and take the New York view. She didn't cow to anybody. She stood up to them. She thought everybody should have their own voice and she decided that she wanted to mix it up. And for that, I think she would be considered a provocateur, wouldn't you? <laughs> so she fits right in here. Along with those other terms that we see here, she was a wonderful person and through her, uh, her uh, uh, money and for, uh, through her management style and involvement with the community, plus the continuation of 50 years of, uh, of uh, service uh, with the uh, LNT Brindley Guild, uh, I think she made major contributions to uh, Colorado Springs and beyond for over a century. And that's all I have except a quick epilogue. Epilogue, her money went to her uh, nieces and nephews and descendants, and that big house that she lived in for 20 years became a boarding house, then it was demolished for Shepherd Citation's parking lot, and now it's the parking lot for the Young Life Service Center. That's all I have. Hopefully you've enjoyed this.